Then um, I will switch to the resolution. And so here's an, uh, an example. In this case, it's of SPECT. Uh, and in SPECT also, the results are a bit more spectacular. And that is because the SPECT suffers from a position dependent uh, resolution, which can be get pretty bad due to the coordinate. And if you don't correct for it, that does a lot of damage. And if you correct for it, then the, the result is, is, uh, is pretty good. Okay. <clears throat> so here uh, we, we have this uh, gamma camera that is looking at this, this uh, two dimensional patient. And uh, because of the collimator, we have this uh, the fact that the camera is not really computing line integrals or acquiring line integrals, but cone integrals. And so we need to model those if you want to account for it during the reconstruction and then also during the uh, to, during the projection and also during the back projection. Here is an example. So I take a sinogram, put one pixel to unity and everything else to zero, and then I compute the back projection and I should see that sensitivity trace, which in this case is a code. Note that if, if I would compute the total sensitivity along a horizontal line here, and also here, I get exactly the same value. Um, so th that means that the sensitivity of the system is actually not varying in the vertical direction. It is varying locally here, but if an object is larger than the resolution, it will be seen by the same sensitivity because that sensitivity integrates to the same value everywhere. The same is true in PET. If you go along an LOR and you integrate the total sensitivity in a plane orthogonal to the LOR, you always get exactly the same value. But if you look very close, then the value is not the same. So that means if I put a point source here or here, I will get a different value in that particular pixel. If I put a big object here, that value would be um, the same. But if I put a point source here, it will be seen by fewer pixels. If I put a point source here, it will be seen by more pixels at lower sensitivity. So again, we will get the same amount of counts. So pretty subtle. Now we're going to rotate this thing around and then make the reconstructions. So well, first acquire the sinogram and here is the sinogram. And here you can also see the effect of the position dependent blur. So the gamma camera is here close to the heart. Then you see that the, the heart, um, well, the, the wall of the heart, the lateral and septal wall are, are clearly seen here. We rotate over 360 degrees. So 180 degrees later, we should see about the same thing and we do, but here it's much blurrier. And that is because at the other side, the gamma camera is further away from the heart and the collimator blurring does more damage. And that means that, um, there is inconsistency in these projections. Unless we model that resolution, then we can explain why we see the same thing with different resolution here. Okay, so here we have a sinogram and we start with one without noise. And here we have the same sinogram, but with uh, Poisson noise uh, on top of it. Now we're gonna do uh, two reconstructions. One with an MLM algorithm that uses a simple projector and also simple back projector, assuming that the measurement is uh, acquired with line integrals and, uh, and that produces these results. So if we do that and we reconstruct from the noise-free sinogram, we get this image. And the image is blurry. And that is because we told the computer that the gamma camera has very sharp eyes and still it observed something blurry. So that means that the object has to be blurry. And all the blurriness that comes from the collimator is actually now assigned to the object and, and put in the image. As a result, this image is much more smooth than the true image. If there is Poisson noise on top of that, then you see that, that a lot of that noise happily propagates into the in image and is, is put here. And the reason is that by putting all these, these uh, hot and cold little spots here, the line integrals uh, become more similar to this noisy uh, sign. Now, here is the alternative. Now we use a, an MLM algorithm that does model the collimator blurring. 
And here are the results. And you see that in the noise-free case, we clearly get a sharper image. So that, that is good, it's closer to the truth. And that is because now the program sees the blurring, but knows that uh, if, if it would, if you would initialize with this image, then it would during simulation blur it some more and see that the final sinogram that it obtains is even blurrier than the measured one. And that way it would start making the sinogram sharp. And interestingly, if we have noise on the, on the sinogram, then that noise propagates much less. So we gain twice by modeling the resolution. Um, we get a sharper image. And on, in addition, we get less noise. Um, because of preservation of misery, we also have to pay twice. So during every iteration, we have more work to do because computing cone integrals takes more computer time than computing line integrals. And in addition, we need to iterate longer. So the experience is the, the more you model the physics, um, the actually the, the, the more you condition your problem becomes and the more iterations you need to get into the final image. Stated more simply, not the blurring is easier than the blurring. It takes more work to do a decent degree. Okay, <laughs> and here's an example uh, that, that uh, is pretty old now, but I keep it because I found it very interesting. So this is a scan of a child, a bone scan, and medical doctors are always very frustrated by images of children because the resolution, the relative resolution of the systems is poor. They, they are used to the resolution they see in adults where they can see details that are invisible in children, which is very frustrating for them. And so one of those medical doctors came to me and said, well, you're working on reconstruction, do something about this, this is really way too bad. And so at that time we had implemented MLM with uh, Gaussian diffusion, which is one way to model the collimated blurry. And so we applied it to the study and then we got these results. So uh, this is a maximum intensity prediction at the right and at the left is a cross section. And you see visually it looks a lot sharper, but as we know, um, the blurring is an ill post problem. We'll discuss it in the, in the next slides. So I was a bit worried that part of this so-called sharper look is actually due to artifacts rather than to data. So I asked the medical doctor if he could find some artifacts and we've been sitting together on the screen and he felt that everything he could see here that was not visible there was data. To him it made sense. He believed this to be real. I think this is more true in SPEC than in PET because the resolution from the two opposite projections is very different. And so if you model the resolution and you do MLM reconstruction, then uh, MLM will assign higher weight to um, the views that have the best resolution. And the, the poorer views will not heavily be used and they will no, have no adverse effect on the final reconstruction. While if you don't model it, both views are equally important and the, the result will be blurred because one of the views wants a blurry result. So the gain is pretty high. Actually, my feeling is it's even better than in PET. Having said that, in PET we have resolution problems too, of course. Uh, as you know, the positron um, is emitted with kinetic energy and it needs to get rid of that. Uh, before it can annihilate, and that depends uh, on the on the tracer. Um, in addition, it gets rid of most of its energy, but there is still some left, so there is still some finite uh, momentum. And then it hits an electron, and then the two photons need to have the same momentum as the original particles, which is never exactly zero. So there is always a small deviation. Um, which causes on, <clears throat> on the average about 2.5 millimeter loss of resolution in the center of a one meter uh, diameter scanner. So the effect is small. <clears throat> and if the diameter is smaller, the effect will be smaller still. So in, in small animal imaging, where you have micro pet systems with diameter of 10 or 20 centimeters, the effect is very small. And then an important effect is this. So if, if I put the point source in the center of a scanner and two photons are emitted, then it's very likely that this photon will uh, 
undergo Compton or photoelectric effect in this crystal. And if it Compton, that Compton photon will propagate, but still has a good chance to scintillate again in the same crystal, such that most of the time, just this crystal and this crystal are activated. Uh, resulting in pretty good resolution because we know uh, the line uh, between the crystals. But here, closer to the edge of the field of view, this point source can send photons into this crystal, but if they don't attenuate, then they can propagate into the next crystal. And you know, these crystals are very long, but very thin. So crossing that crystal, just a few millimeters, not that difficult. So it can hit any of those crystals. And if it does that, um, and since we don't know where in the crystal the uh, scintillation took place, uh, that creates a lot of uh, possible LORs. So here, for example, it scintillates in the bottom of this crystal. We don't know where it scintillates, so we use the, the typical expected scintillation depth, which is like in, in three millimeter crystals would be less than a centimeter, uh, three centimeter crystals would be, I think, a bit less than a centimeter. So we put them always there. And as a result, we have all these LORs that are actually activated just by this photon. And that means we have a much larger uncertainty there. This is a reason to make sure that the, the patient is in the center of the scanner and not at the edge. Okay, so we also have a loss of resolution there and we can model it. <clears throat> now for brain imaging, you would put your patient here. You can get away with modeling the resolution as a shifting variant. It's not true, but the experience is that modeling the resolution more or less accurately is much, much better than not modeling it. And modeling the resolution extremely accurately is only slightly better or produces only slightly better results than modeling it uh, far less accurately. So here we made two reconstructions with OSEM, one without modeling the resolution, another one with shift invariant uh, image-based resolution model. And here you see the same results as before for the spect. We gain twice. The image looks a lot sharper, and the noise, a lot of the noise has been stopped. <clears throat> okay, so now we can have a, a closer look uh, at that uh, result to show that it, it's not perfect, actually. So here is. Uh, uh, simulation based on the brain web phantom. So in this case, we know the true uh, tracer distribution. And then we have uh, simulated sinograms with attenuation and with uh, finite resolution, but not noise. And then we make two reconstructions, one without resolution modeling and one with resolution modeling. And as expected, well, there is no noise, so no difference there. But the one with resolution modeling is clearly sharper than that. But now we can have a closer look, for example, here. And then you see that we should have this uh, yeah, folded gray matter, so this gyri here. Here you don't see much of that, it's all blurred. And here the resolution is recovered, but not correctly. Like for example, here is now a blob of gray matter and that blob that doesn't exist, it's actually a fold. Same here, it, it's a fold. So the algorithm did its very best, but it didn't do it perfect. And so the question then is, yeah, what, what went wrong here? Did we do something wrong or, or why exactly is this happening? And so here is a, a, a simple 1D simulation study where we focus on the resolution modeling just to check how difficult this is, it is and if it is ex to be expected that we get imperfect results. So just consider this true distribution. And then I simulate a measurement which is blurred. In this case, no projections, just a blurring uh, camera, a one dimensional cam uh, camera. And then we use an algorithm to de blur it. And we can do that with maximum likelihood. So if we apply that algorithm, then this is what happens. <clears throat> so th these are the iterations. And uh, here you, you see how these iterations evolve. And you see that in the early iterations, we get these over and under shoots. And if we iterate longer and longer, then these uh, over and under shoots get smaller, but the height remains the same. 
Okay, this thing has a non-negativity constraint, but as you can see, I put the activity, the minimum at 0.2, so we're not limited by the non-negativity constraint. So, and this is a known effect and Gibbs, uh, I don't know if this Gibbs is the same Gibbs as the Gibbs prior, but he studied it and he computed how high this, this, uh, this value is. So, very predictable. But for us, that is a problem because as you can see, these overshoots can combine. So here we just change the size of the object. Then you see that in the middle, you get a dip here and then an overshoot, which is the sum of these two peaks. And that's pretty bad because our medical doctors are very interested, at least for oncology, in seeing small hot regions. And you see if they're small enough in one dimension already, we get an overshoot. If we have the same in two dimensions, then it will be worse because we get the same contribution from two dimensions and still worse in three dimensions. So to better understand that, we can have a look at the uh, Fourier transform. And so here is the uh, a spot, uh, an infinitely or not infinitely one pixel thin spot. And if you take the Fourier transform from, from that and look at the spectrum, then you see that you need all the frequencies to model that spot. So the Fourier transform of the pulse is just flat. <clears throat> now, if we have a system with a finite point spread function, then every image we acquire will be convolved with that point spread function, meaning that every pulse we see will be replaced by a blob. If we see two, two pulses, we will have two blobs. And if we see a million pulses, we will have a million blobs instead. So if we take the Fourier transform of that blob, we will get uh, something like this, at least the spectrum, the frequency spectrum. And as you know, if I make this blob wider and wider, this thing will get uh, narrower and narrower. If I make this one narrower, this will get wider. And if it, I make it as narrow as this one, then this thing will just be flat again. Now, if I put noise on top of that point spread function, then the spectrum looks like this, where we now have all frequencies. This was Poisson noise. And as you know, that uncorrelated and the Fourier transform of uncorrelated noise is white, it's flat. So we get a noise contribution everywhere. I show this to show that we have little hope to recover here. So here, these values, if this is a Gaussian, then this is a Gaussian too. They're never zero, but they quickly get extremely small. With a bit of noise, they will be lost forever because the noise is much higher than you see here. Okay, so now we're going to try to recover the frequencies. We can do that with MLM or, or with uh, Richard Son Lucy, or you can invent lots of algorithms that would do the same thing. But you cannot uncover what has been basically multiplied with zero. So we can recover all these frequencies, but there is no hope for these ones. So either we keep them zero or we invent something, but there is no way to put back what should be there. So MLM prefers to not invent anything at all. It, if it cannot see frequencies, it doesn't recover them. And that means that if we would uh, apply MLM like forever, we should get something like this, where all these frequencies that are still measured have been restored to their correct value, which actually should be uh, point, point 0.8. Not sure why this is not unique. And then from here somewhere where the frequencies basically become undetectable, uh, we don't recover anything because we have no data. And if you take the inverse Fourier transform of a block, then you get a, a sync function, which is a sign divided by X. All right. And so that sign has wild oscillations. And if I convolve this with uh, a block function, then I get this over and under shoots that keeps already uh, observed. All right, so now we have the following problem. I have this true object and then I blur it, then it looks like that. And then the question is, if I give you the red thing, what is the true object? And here are solutions. You can take this solution, which is this convolved by a sink, and if I blur it, I get this fine, so this is a solution. This ugly guy is also a solution. Same for here, same for here. So we have an interesting problem, which is that we get a huge amount of solutions. 
And uh, fortunately, in a way, MLM prefers always to use this solution. It is fortunate because if MLM would also include stuff like that, we would be very unhappy and we would no longer claim that the noise doesn't propagate. The only reason that the noise doesn't propagate is that MLM refuses to reconstruct anything that has not been seen. Uh, <coughs> and so it, it, there is a lot of noise that it cannot explain because if it would put a, a hot spot in the image to explain the noise, then that hot spot would project as a blob. So that means it can only explain lower frequencies from the noise, but it has no way to explain high frequencies. So all the frequencies that are basically killed by the blurring, they will not be reconstructed. And that eliminates a lot of noise. But the drawback of always picking this solution is of course that we have these over and under sheets. You could avoid them, like this one is a lot steeper, but then that can have all kinds of other nasty side effects. This solution exists too, of course, but it, it's hard to obtain. Then about that um, over and undershoot. So here I've done an experiment where I take, um, so there is a, an object, I'm not sure if you can see, but there is some activity outside here and there is a hotspot in the center. So I put the activity around it to avoid uh, the non-negativity uh, effects with complicate things. They, they exist in practice, so we should look at it, but usually hotspots are inside patients and patients are usually not active. Uh, not not uh, entirely cold, um, so this is somewhat realistic. And now I make uh, simulate a blurred projection from that and reconstruct it with the resolution recovery obtained in this MLM reconstruction. And then I repeat on doing that while I make the object grow. And then I have always put the central pixel in that plot here. And you see that in the beginning when the object is very small, the uh, MLM is unable to fully restore it and we get residual blurring. So we get a, a poor recovery coefficient. And then if the objects get bigger and bigger, then we get to a recovery of 100%, which is pretty good, but then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Still. And now you see that in three dimensions, you can get an overshoot of up to 100% if you design the object exactly right. So uh, this, uh, this is done in 3D, so this is a, a sphere. So in 3D, you can have a dramatic overshoot. If you then further increase, then you get, the tip, as you also have seen in that little 1D animation. And so if you make the object still larger and larger, we will go along the sink and see all the oscillations of the sink until it flattens out. And so similar effects you can see here. So this slide I got from Georg. And so this is the, the NEMA phantom. Um, with, with, uh, these are spheres also, six spheres of different size. And here they have been reconstructed without resolution modeling and here with resolution modeling. Um, and as you can see, these images are a lot sharper. The noise has been suppressed. So for detection, these are definitely as good or better than those. For quantification, well, probably true because the, also because the, the activity Concentration is the same here, and I, you still can guess that. But if you look at this small spot, if you look at the center, that's really way too hot. So we get an overshoot here. And then for the bigger ones, you can see that they have a hot boundary and a cold region in the center. So you see the same effect in, in the real data, of course. You see, like uh, by modeling the resolution and suppressing the noise, you start seeing this detail that is here a little uh, rod, which has some activity to it. You start seeing it here, you hardly see it here. And same for this one, I can see it here, not here. So some detail is revealed that you wouldn't see. So for lesion detection, this resolution modeling is definitely beneficial. And here an analysis uh, of uh, the same uh, phantom measurement by Georg. So the, the gray thing, is the uh, central profile from the center outside. Um, so this gray block is the ac activity concentration inside the sphere. And this gray block is the activity concentration outside. And this little dip is there because the phantom has finite size. So there is a wall of the plastic which has zero activity in it. Um, and then uh, all these little dots are uh, all profiles. Um, 
so you don't average the profiles. Or the, or the red is the average profile. Yeah, the red is the fit, I suppose, and the profiles are not average. So we see all the profiles. And then he's fitting, um, uh, yeah, a blurred, uh, a blurring of the gray stuff basically to it. And then you see that um, that here we have these overshoots that you would not expect with simple Gaussian blurring. And you see that those overshoots, yeah, they de depend a bit on the size of the object. And if the object is pretty small, then they actually get a bit higher. Because of course, for small objects, we have fewer points, so it's harder to see. But this basically agrees with what I've been showing before. 